Hi, my name is Deborah Verholden. I'm going to be talking today about the human capital consequences of incarceration. I am an associate professor at the Bloomberg School of Public Health in the Department of Mental Health, and I'm also the deputy director of the CDC-funded Center for the Prevention of Youth Violence. Human capital is defined as the capital stock of, I'm sorry, human capital is the stock of competencies, knowledge, habits, social, and personality attributes that include things like creativity, cognitive abilities, embodied in the ability to perform labor so as to produce economic value. Incarceration can be viewed as a disruption to one's life and among many other things, incarceration has an impact on an individual, their community, and the larger society. More importantly, and what I'm going to talk about is how incarceration undermines one's human capital and basic capacity to be an active, thriving member of the community, the larger community, and also to be economically viable. So what are the real costs of incarceration? The average cost for a federal incarceration is about $30,000 annually. Over the course of five years, without inflation, that's about $150,000 that we spend to incarcerate an individual for five years. What are the benefits of incarceration? An incarcerated person earns between zero and about $500 as a cap um, annually. Over five years without inflation, an incarcerated individual is earning between nothing and $2,500. On the other hand, you look at the cost of community programming. Communities, uh, community programs that provide comprehensive services like job readiness, GED, smoking cessation, um, health prevention programs. Those programs cost on average about eight to $11,000 per year and typically run no more than one year in duration. So on average for a community program that'll get someone ready for the job force, assist them with job placement, help them meet health needs, help them meet housing needs out in the community, we're spending about eight to $11,000 annually and those programs typically are one year in duration. So over a five year period, we're spending about eight to $11,000 per person. Compare that to 150000 per person for the five-year cost of an incarceration, and there's a clear gap and a clear advantage to servicing people in the community compared to serving people in prisons. Where the biggest, to me, um, benefit comes in is when you compare the benefits of community programs to the very minuscule benefits that one gets during incarceration. So the average income of a person coming out of a community a community um, readiness program is about 33000 per year. So where someone in prison is earning between zero and $500 per year, someone who's coming out of a program with a GED, ready for the workforce, assistance in job placement, is earning on average between $12 and $17 an hour. Roughly averaged out to be about $33,000 a year. Average five-year income, about $170,000. So compared to the $2,500 max that someone in, car in prison is earning, someone out in the community is earning nearly $170,000. The interesting thing is that the cost for community programs is substantially lower, but we have a fraction of people in community programs compared to the number of people who are in prison. Other ways that incarceration impacts human capital, there are severe psychological consequences, sociological consequences, physiological and physical consequences, there's this myth that somehow people in the community who otherwise wouldn't have access to health care are gaining access to better health care in prison, but in fact the data do not support that people come out of prison in better physical health than they went in. There are severe socio-emotional consequences as well as severe impacts on their social networks. As you can imagine, being incarcerated for five years, you've developed a social network of fellow prisoners. There are also spiritual as well as community impacts. The most important impact on human capital is both on their employability and the rates of recidivism. So to put this in a context, if we know that community programming is better than prison, why is it that we have such a problem and such high rates of incarceration? It's interesting because when you talk to people who are actually in prison, many people who've gone through the criminal justice system have internalized that incarceration is a good thing. In preparation for being here today, I spoke to several young men, one of whom recently um, returned home from a five-year prison sentence. And he said that prison was the best thing that ever happened to me. We as a society, I would assert, believe in punishment. 
I talked to his mother and she said, these boys need to learn the streets ain't it. It was interesting to me to find out that a mother, someone who gave birth to, watched this person grow and mature, in her mind, he deserved to go to prison because he made a mistake or he did a bad act. So that I would offer that there's general consensus in our society that punishment is somewhere between tolerable and deserved. That context has it be that we go to prisons instead of community programs as our first line of defense and our first remedy for what I would consider to be more social and structural inequalities. As another contextual sort of background to understanding how crime and punishment work, I would offer that we are in an inequitable, unfair, and unjust system. There's inequities in both who's targeted for the criminal justice system as well as how people are treated and the sentences that they receive once they're in the system. Lastly, I want to note that there are stark differences in both the economies and the opportunities of the illicit and the illicit marketplace. This young man that I spoke to when he came out of prison, the only job that he was able to secure was selling vacuum cleaners door to door. On average, he makes about $500 for every, it's a very high-end vacuum. On average, he makes about $500 for every vacuum that he sells. And I said, well, how often do you sell a vacuum? And I actually thought that was pretty good. I'm thinking he was going to say something like once a day. He said, I sell maybe one every five to seven days, but about a third of the deals that I broker actually fall through. People's credit isn't sufficient. They can't get the financing, et cetera, et cetera. So his sales actually reflect about one vacuum cleaner every 10 days. So on average, he's making about $500 every 10 days. When I asked him what he went to prison for, he went to prison for distribution of crack cocaine. He was selling crack cocaine on the corner four houses from where his house was. So there was no commute to work. He would wake up, walk down his front steps, walk four houses to the corner. He didn't have to knock on doors. He would get out there around 11 o'clock. He said there would be between 40 and 80 people that would come and see him the first 10 minutes that he was on the corner. He was selling $5 rocks of crack and making $750 to $1,200 a day, working between five and seven hours a day, four houses from his house. So there are different pay scales and different opportunities between the illicit and the illicit marketplace. The paradox of our age is there's much in the window and nothing in the store. We have all of these visions of the American dream. We have all of these opportunities. We have all of these programs. But they're not reaching the people that they need to reach. They're not impacting the people that they need to impact. So as a result, we have our most vulnerable and marginalized populations overrepresented in the prison system with a profound impact on their human capital, their families, their community, and our larger society. So what are some alternatives to the current paradigm? Well, there are actual policy level interventions that we can do. The lion's share of young men in prison are there for nonviolent drug offenses. We have had, since the um, Anti-Drug Abuse Act, a 1 to 100 sentencing disparity in crack versus powder cocaine. That law has single-handedly been used to launch an attack on African American men. And the majority of people who are in prison under that um, Anti-Drug Abuse Act are African American males. In 2013, President Obama implemented the Fair Sentencing Act and reduced the disparity from 1 to 100 to 1 to 18. I would offer that crack cocaine and powder cocaine are chemically the same compound. It should be a 1 to 1 ratio. We could actually go back and repeal those sentences. Consistent with that is banning the box. It's an important thing. It's a life sentence, not just going to prison, but the record that then follows you for the rest of your life. Your employability, your earning potential, and the licit marketplace is forever compromised once you have that record. As far as prevention goes, we have community-based resources. Our police know exactly where to go to find young black men, young Hispanic men, young people at risk who are either engaged in criminal activity or are at risk for it. Our community-based resources should be shadowing this approach and shadowing our police officers and getting them before the police do. The final note that I want to make is we are talking about the social determinants of health. If we are to have any hope or any promise of dealing with the massive disaster and the massive human injustice of incarceration, we must begin to address the structural and social inequalities that are linked to incarceration, health, and well-being in our society.
Thank you.